Critical race theory is being battled around the country. Earlier this week, we talked about Iowa Governor Reynolds, who signed into law a new bill that really pr prohibits certain concepts from being taught in Iowa schools as part of their curriculum. Now we're hearing that Florida is doing the same thing. In fact, the Florida Board of Education, they adopted a rule in Florida that bans critical race theory. So we're going to take a look at what's happening here. Governor Ron DeSantis from Florida also gave us a little bit more information about kind of how this rule works. So we're going to talk about that. Then in this segment, we're also going to hear from a woman who is somebody who escaped from China and actually came over to this country to flee some of the same concerns that we're dealing with right now. I'm talking about critical race theory, which many people uh, sort of know and recognize as something that evolved from a Marxist ideology. Back then, talking about things like class, right? The capitalist, uh, the, the bourgeois, and uh, the proletariat, and then we have now sort of a, a race, racial distinction. Back then, under you know the original Marxist Engels uh, ideology, it was about class. Now today, it's sort of morphed into this thing that's, that's about race. And we're seeing people who've lived through the first version of that voice their concerns that they're they're seeing this happen in America and they're not liking the direction that it's going. So we're going to hear from that woman. And then we've got uh, one other topic, but I can't remember what it is, but we'll see what it is at the end of this segment. So let's get going. We're going to start by going over to Breitbart. They give us some background here. They're going to show us what the rule actually says. So the Florida Board of Education, it approved a proposal on Thursday, which outlines the teaching of American history, banning critical race theory from being taught in classrooms across the state. So while the rule did not specifically mention critical race theory, which is the same thing, we saw that in Iowa as well, that they're, they're, they're not actually using that word. They're saying, though, that it is preventing teachers from trying to, quote, indoctrinate or persuade students to a particular point of view, right? So we, we sort of talk about this in, uh, in the law. We've talked about some limitations on free speech and you know the government can place these things called time manner and place restrictions so you know you can't uh, you know protest with a bullhorn out somebody outside somebody's private residence at two in the morning for example right that might be a violation of a local noise ordinance and the the courts have said well that that noise ordinance is okay because it's just a time place and manner restriction on your speech if, there, if you want to get a permit for that, that's fine. Go get a permit, protest over here in this free speech zone. So we have some little areas that we can you know, maneuver free speech around a little bit. And here, what we're talking about is issues that may be popping up under the free speech guise as this is working its way through the courts. So in, in, this, in this case, they're talking about not limiting a particular point of view which sort of mirrors what we're talking about under First Amendment, right? So I mentioned the time, place, and manner restrictions. Those are okay, but if the government came back out and said, we're going to put a restriction on you that says you can't talk about a certain type of content, that would not be allowed, okay? That's a content-based restriction. Now that's impacting, that's burdening your freedom of speech because it's saying that you have to say a certain thing or you can't say a certain thing because it's a content-based prohibition versus a time, place, and manner prohibition. Okay, so sort of here what they're doing is they're saying it's almost like the, it, 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 it's, it's a, almost mirrors that same concept, right? So the government can't come in and tell you what to say or what not to say. Here, they're saying schools also can't tell you what to say or persuade students what to say or what not to say, right? They can't indoctrinate or persuade them to a particular point of view, but they maybe they could communicate about multiple different points of view and then allow the student to figure it out for themselves. Let's read what the rule says. Again, this was written over by Kyle Morris. The rule states, instruction on the required topics must be factual and objective and may not suppress or distort significant historical events such as the Holocaust, and may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based on largely universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Sounds kind of content-y, doesn't it? Let's see what else it says. The new language was offered in an amendment by board member Tom Grady during Thursday's meeting held downtown Florida. 
DeSantis attended the Tuesday meeting where he said Florida's education system must implement fact over narrative, describing the teaching of critical race theory as outrageous. Some of this stuff, he says, I think is really toxic. He said to the school board, I think it's going to cause a lot of divisions. Yeah, I think it'll cause people to think of themselves more as a member of a particular race based on skin color rather than based on the content of their character and based on their hard work or what they're trying to accomplish in life. Last month, he blasted critical race theory, uh, theory saying it is based on historical fals falsehoods. He says it teaches people to view that as the most basic characteristic. And obviously, if you're certain races, Caucasian, whatnot, they view you in that negative fashion. That is not something that's appropriate for schools. He says it's based on historical falsehoods. For example, some of these people have said the American Revolution was fought uh, because they wanted to preserve slavery. Really? In Lexington and Concord? That's what they were fighting about? Did they say that? Really? DeSantis also stated that it would be offensive to have taxpayers fund teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other. Yeah, I mean, that's really... I, I, that's what it feels like to me. All right, so he posted this here on Twitter to give us some background on what's going on here. It says Florida, Florida's education system exist to create opportunity for children critical race theory theory teaches our kids to hate each other it is state sanctioned racism has no place in florida so here's what this law says 6a 1.094124 and again right this is being posted by the governor so keep that lens on what the amendment does it teaches students how to think not what to think which is a good concept fosters an environment where they can think critically and for themselves Right now, let, you know, if you put on your critical race theory hat for a minute, not that I agree with it, but let's just put our hat on for a minute, whatever that looks like. Now, it says you know, they would make the argument that they are doing this, right? That, that by communicating about their you know, oppressor victim ideology, this concept of systemic racism that racism is built into our environment it's not just personal it's actually built into the things that we do that's kind of what the concept of crt is all about so they would say that they are encouraging students to think critically by educating them about the horrors of the white man now it all right so that that so they they would say no well that also applies to us now this one i think they fail not what to think they they, they want you to think that they're not asking your opinion on this right they're not saying well hey johnny do you think that there is systemic racism, yes or no, and what are your pros and cons for that? It's really not, I mean, from, from what we have been seeing, it's not about that. Because the conversation, the rebuttal, has always been, it's actually not even a question, really. It's really more about if you do not accept the underlying premise that there is systemic racism and that there is a concept of white privilege that exists in our society, if you disagree with that premise, it's only because of your very own white privilege and your white supremacy. So you see how circular that is? So you can't even have a conversation about it. If you are a college student and you say, yes, but professor, but I object, they say, no, that's because you're a white, you're white and you're a racist and you have white privilege. So, and you go, oh, so I guess I can't express a contrarian perspective here. You can, if you're a racist. You go, I'm not a racist, so I guess I'll just sit here and shut up and work my way through the schools and hope that you don't get damaged and come out a Marxist on the other end. Now, this also says it protects students from being influenced or indoctrinated to think a certain way, right? And so their, their response is going to be, it's just the opposite of that. They, they're going to say that the white people are indoctrinating them into white, into systemic white you know, supremacy or systemic racism. He also says it ensures students receive classroom instruction that is factual and objective, helps guarantee teacher service facilitators of classroom discussion without making students feel pressured to think a certain way, and provides a well-rounded, world-class education that exposes students to multiple viewpoints and perspectives on a litany of topics. So, you know, this is, you know, this is obviously a problem. I think that the critical race theory is, is, is actual racism that is masquerading as, uh, you know, education. So... I guess that's, again, you know, you, you know why I'm not allowed to say that, because obviously I'm white. I've tried to get rid of this malignant parasitic condition, but it's hard. I think I'm stuck with it. So I'm, I'm very curious to see how the courts are going to deal with this, because you're going to see the same response from the CRT people, from the CL, ACLU, when they start filing lawsuits. They're going to say, this is viewpoint discrimination. They're going to say that I have the ability to communicate within the, the confines of my contract or whatever and 
this is discriminatory. It's a violation of equal protection. Those lawsuits are coming and we're going to have to see what the Supreme Court does about it because they're going to have some good claims there. You know, if, if schools are, this is why on these issues, I, I think that the choice conversation is the better answer here. It, you know, rather than having the state dictate how the state deals with education for everybody, you just go with choice. If they want to be a CRT school, they can they can do that, right? And we just give the students a certain amount of money. If we're going to go that route and say you you pick wherever you want to go, and you just see how the market decides, rather than you know a one size fits all solution. Because put let's put our hats on the other on on, on the other side of this thing. Okay, what if a governor came out like Ron DeSantis and passed a law? with a legislature that said, we're going to teach critical race theory in every single school across our state, right? You, you, you rightfully flip out for good reason, because it's actual racism in my opinion. But the point here is I think blanket policies, I'm just not a huge fan of that. You know, I don't, I don't really like the government telling us what to do either way. And I have a huge problem with critical race theory, but I just don't know that the solution are these blanket mandates. It's probably not a, a popular perspective because this stuff is so reprehensible that it feels like this is the only thing that can be done. You've got academia, you've got all the teachers unions, everybody's in lockstep with this concept. You have clinical doctors, people who are on the board at New York and San Francisco who are writing legitimate articles now that are being published in health periodicals that say that we are malignant white, we, me, I'm a white person, a malignant parasite. I have this condition that exists in me. This guy's a psychologist or psychiatrist who's probably counseled many, many white people throughout his days, and who knows what kind of damage he has done to them. So now if you're somebody who's going, well, you know, Rob, I kind of do like the free market system, and I don't like one-size-fits-all government bureaucracy programs and government mandates like education, but I don't know what else to do. My kid needs to go to school and these teachers are telling him that he's a racist oppressor and what am I supposed to do about that? This is the only alternative. And this is kind of where this is going, my friends. You know, this, this, if you read the literature and you listen to the people who are really behind it, the, the, the cultural Marxist, they are the accelerationists. They want to create more of this division. They want to see hard lines drawn in the sand so that society starts duking it out with each other. And we are going that direction very quickly. And where's it going to go? Where's it going to take us? Well, let's listen in. We've got a nice warning here from a woman who has escaped communism, the Marxist nightmare that existed over in China back during the 70s before they started modernizing a bit and really sort of taking some of the good parts of capitalism and smashing it into their economy. Anyways, let's take a look at this woman. So we've seen a lot of these images or these videos of people going in front of the boards out just tired of it. I've had enough of it. And I'm, we're going to start communicating and make our voices heard. And I absolutely love this. I mean, this makes me so happy that people are doing this because I think that locally is where it starts. I'm on a local board in Scottsdale doing my part. I encourage people to get involved in your local government because this is where you can make a change. You can make a difference. You can get in front of these people and scream at them, right? Kamala Harris is never going to watch this video. She should, but she's not. But my the people local in local government, they'll, they'll, I have some representation there. I have a, a closer one-to-one -one relationship with the people that we can do business with in making the government that we want to live in. So I love that this is happening and this woman comes and she tells it it's beautiful. Let's watch this. This. Uh, what's going on in our school? You are now teaching. Let's start over again. <clears throat> what's going on in our school? You are now teaching, training our children to be social justice warriors and to loathe our country and our history. Uh, growing up in Mao's China, all this seemed very familiar. The uh, communist regime used the same critical theory to divide people. The only difference is they use class instead of race. During the Cultural Revolution, I witnessed students and teachers again, turned against each other. We changed school names to be politically correct. Um, we were taught to denounce our heritage. The Red Guards destroy anything that is not communist. Old uh, statues, books, and anything else. <clears throat> we are also encouraged to report on each other, just like the uh, Student Equity Ambassador Program and the Bias Reporting System. This is indeed the American version of the Chinese communist, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. The critical race theory has its roots in cultural Marxism. It should have no place in our school. Yeah. Yeah, get it. Yeah, I'd love that. Yes, perfect. It should have no place in the schools. It is something that emanates from Marxism. And she just hit it on the head. You know, 
people all the time, well, hey, you know, communism, what if it's just been tried in a different way? You know, we haven't tried it in its purest form. If we had good people running communism, it'd be great. No, it doesn't work like that because human beings are not perfect. We all have our mistakes. We're all infall infallible. And it doesn't work as it is fantasized about. But for some reason, it's still being gobbled up across co college campuses across the country. So uh, not good. Now, that is taking place in the schools. So this week, we spent time talking about CRT in schools. We've talked about it in health with the psychologist who says that we're all parasites. And now we have it, of course, in the military. So the Epoch Times is telling us that hundreds of whistleblowers say that the military is forcing anti-American indoctrination on them. This is according to Senator Tom Cotton over from Arkansas. He told Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin that hundreds of military whistleblowers have reported being forced to receive anti-American indoctrination in the military. And this is the, this is the American military. This is not the Chinese military. So what I'm saying is that our own soldiers are being crammed and force-fed anti-American indoctrination in the American military. Seems like that could be a problem. And he's talking about critical race theory as well. In a Senate hearing with Austin, Cotton claimed that within the military, there's plummeting morale, there's growing mistrust between races and sexes where none existed just six months ago, and there's unexpected retirements and separations based on these trainings alone. People are leaving. One whistleblower, Cotton said, that the military history training was replaced with training about police brutality, which is strange because they're in the military, not in the law academy. They're also learning about systemic racism. Okay. And white privilege. And another said that his unit had to read white fragility by the author and critical theory proponent, Robin D'Angelo, according to the Senator in May space force confirmed it relieved Lieutenant Matthew Lomir, the somebody we talked about here. He was a commander for writing a book. It didn't specifically name the reason why it said that he made some announce. He made some comments during a podcast where he denounced CRT in space force. Now, according to the Epoch Times, CRT, which draws heavily upon Marxist critical theory and postmodernist writers, denounces the U.S. and Western culture as oppressive, often claims that American culture and institutions are promoting systemic racism or white supremacy. Some critics have said the ideology's proponents apply the Marxist tactic of, tra of class struggle to drive people along the lines of gender, race, ethnicity, rather than the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Yeah. In the hearing, Austin told Cotton that some training is designed to make the armed forces welcoming to everyone who can qualify. Now, I watched this, by the way. I actually watched it. I didn't clip it for the show, but I watched it. It was about seven minutes. The reason I didn't clip it, because it wasn't that, wasn't that interesting, honestly. What Cotton gives us is interesting, and it's all in this article. He's talking about a lot of these complaints. That he actually reads through some of them. And you're going, man, that just, that just, that sounds terrible. They're actually separating people into whites and, you know, other sex orientations and different colors. The whole thing is just messy. And it just sounds awful. You know, like you want to go in there and be a part of a team and, you know, be a part of America and go fight for your country and do all of these heroic things. And they're like, uh, this is why you're an oppressor. And this is why he's a victim. And you're going, what? We're not here for this. Anyways, that that's just me. That's 23 year old, you know, Rob, who never served uh, pontificating. All right, let's go back to the article. The Epic Times says, in the article, he said, we're welcoming to everybody who wants to come. Cotton suggested that the military is attempting to foster diversity and says that that is incorrect. He says, it's about a very specific kind of anti-American indoctrination that is seeping into some parts of our military. Based on, the, based on the complaints that we've received. He said, the military for decades has been one of the institutions in our society where you are most likely to get ahead based on your own performance, your own merit, irrespective of the color of your skin and where you came from, who your parents were. Austin agreed with the sentiment. He said, I absolutely agree with that. I am an example of that. Austin went on to state that the military needs to be better, absolutely inclusive, and promote equity. The terms in inclusive and equity have been used in social circles for years. So he then argued that by doing so, it'll be the most effective and lethal fighting force in the world. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess, you know, that guy's got a lot more combat experience than I do. If he thinks that this is the right way to go with things, I, I guess you got to take his word for it, I guess. I don't know. Tom Cotton doesn't think so. I think other people in the military don't necessarily think so. But to be fair to Lloyd Austin, I actually watched the clip and he didn't say much. You know, he said uh, to be, uh, Tom Cotton was asking him questions and he was saying yes or no. 
is the American, is the American military racist? Yes or no? Which I kind of hate those things, right? Because Lloyd Austin goes, well, you know, I can't really give you a yes or no on that. I mean, it's complicated. Well, I only have five minutes, so I need an answer. He goes, well, you know, I mean, if I consider this and this, and then no, I don't think that. You go, all right, good. Glad you agree with me, right? Do you think that, uh, you know, white people are discriminatory? Well, I, I don't, you know, I don't think it's the yes or no question. It takes some time. Let me, you know, but no, in general, I don't think so. Okay, perfect, right? So that was how that whole interview went. But I think the bigger takeaway there was about some of the messages that were coming into Tom Cotton from the military. And it sounds like they are not immune either. Everybody is just being learned what a piece of garbage you are if you are from a disfavored demographic in this country, which is a sad thing. It's unfortunate. Now, let's take some questions over from watching the watchers dot locals dot com, which is where you can support the show and check out some of the other things that we have over there, like a free copy of my book. We have monthly meetups on Zoom. We have a law enforcement interaction training taking place over there. A lot of good reasons. You can also be a part of the show watching the watchers dot locals dot com. All right, let's take a look at Todd. Todd says, I am old enough to remember the good old days when the left made mistakes of unintended consequences. CRT is an unintended consequence by the left. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, I think you're onto something with that, Todd. I think that right now they are of the disposition that this is a big win, you know, that they've got a lot of momentum. Everybody's behind this. This is going to foster and nurture sort of the next line of little good Democrats and commies that are going to be, you know, running things when they retire and ride off into the sunset. But I just don't think that this is going to work in their favor because I think that this actually makes people fundamentally less functional. I mean, I, I, candidly. If you wake up every day thinking that you live in a world where you're the victim, you're being oppressed everywhere you go, you are just not as effective as a person, just in general, right? You're not going to do as well in anything that you do because everything that you're looking for, you're going to find yourself being the oppressor. And people do this anyways, regardless of their skin color. I mean, you know these people in your life, right? They wake up, everything that happens in their life is a problem caused by somebody else. Traffic's bad, that broke, somebody wasn't on time, some guy cut me off, that boss, you know, boss, boss was a jerk. Everything in the world is somebody else's problem. And poor me, the world is just acting upon me. And I am just sitting here, this poor oppressed victim, and, I, and only, only externalities can solve the problem. Okay, I have no personal agency. I can't get out there and make anything of my life because I'm living in a world that is governed by white people. Everywhere I look, there's, I mean, what are you supposed to do if you're a young black man and you're being taught that everything is systemically racist in this world, everything. And you go, okay, well, I want to work to change that. How, where do I start? I, do I go take the financial system on? How about the military system? How about law enforcement? How about any other institution in this country? It's, it's a, it's an, uh, there's no way to win, right? You, you start out a million feet back if you start from the victim mentality, that, that oppressive mentality. And it, it's, I just think it's not going to work. And people are going to sort of think that this is the, the modality for leveling up in life, that they're going to be working with other people who are going to be enforcing these concepts of equity and inclusion and diversity. And nobody even knows what these mean. But then when it gets, when push comes to shove and there's a contract sitting there between two people and there's a dollar amount on there, a million dollars, I'm going to pay you a million dollars and you're going to pay me, the, you're going to give me these services and we're going to enter into this, this agreement. I can almost guarantee you that somebody's not going to go, well, you know, I happen to be of a particular demographic. Therefore, I think you should only, uh, uh, I should only be required to pay you half of that or something, right? That's not how business works. Everybody's going to get up and go, no, that's it. Uh, we're not, what are you, insane? Are you a psycho person? Never, would never do that because it's, it's, it's not functional. All it is, is it's kind of masturbatory, really. And they're, they, they're thinking that they're doing something that's going to, to serve their interest in the long run, but it's not functional. And if you think I'm just making this up, go into a clubhouse room where they're talking about these issues. Go onto a Twitter spaces room and listen to these people try to have a conversation. They're in a room, they're talking about some social issue, about whatever it is, pick one, and watch them try to step all over each other to have a, a serious conversation. You can only spend about 10 minutes in there before you wanna jump out the window. It is dysfunctional because everybody's talking about holding space and not cutting people off and using all this very careful language because everybody has to be bubble wrapped and nobody can offend anybody. 
And so I start thinking about, okay, what if we put all these people in academia and say, hey, you run that college. We put that group of people in front of a corporation. You're now the board of directors. You have to run this organization. Are you kidding me? It's not going to work. It's going to all fail. And it's going to be hilarious as they try to figure it out on the way down. All right. So want to know says Dems are fantastic at naming stuff all naming stuff wrong all the time. Well, they're changing a lot of names now. They're trying to redo some of that. We have LT13 says they camouflage it here in VA as culturally responsive teaching. <laughs> CRT. So they go from critical race theory to cultural responsive teaching. Um, so they're just, they, they like, they really like the letters. Got to keep the letters, but we can change what the words mean because the words aren't as important. We've got Sharon says, it's, if it's okay to teach CRT and follow the market to sort it out, is it okay to teach fascism or anti-Semitism or white supremacy? If not, why not? I mean, it, if, if you want to teach your children that, you, you want me to come in there and, and govern how, you, how every single parent raises their kids? I mean, I think the better way to approach this is to say, we, we, we let these things out in the open. We fester these things, okay? If there want to be a bunch of white supremacists somewhere, I would like to know about that. I'd like to know who they are and what they're teaching and why they're doing it that way. And, and maybe that's naive, but, you know, to just go around and say that we're going to sort of mandate via law what people can do with their own lives, that's kind of the antithesis of freedom. freedom. If, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they want to teach CRT and you've got teachers who want to send their kids to CRT school and teach them to be racist, all right, that's fine. You want to send these people to be a bunch of you know, white supremacists, okay, right? What are we going to do? We, we are not in a position here to micromanage everybody's lives. When we try to do that, we run into all sorts of problems and it's going to create more, more division, I think, in the long run. But Sharon, I totally respect your point and I understand completely why parents might disagree with me on this vehemently and in fact i might disagree with myself if i had kids you know it's like maybe maybe there's something you know about about this freedom concept that just changes when you've got somebody else to think about right and, and i don't i have a lot of other people to think about but not not a child oh yeah i know much to my mom's dismay all right, let's take a look at underscore shade it says, unfortunately, people are leaving state schools, jobs, military. I do see why. But how is this solving the problem when good people leave? I'm in California and don't plan on leaving at least yet. Personally, I feel we need to we need more to stand, hold space, if nothing else. In other words, stand our ground. You know, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a there's a uh, gentleman running for governor of California. He's a big YouTuber. I follow him. I think he, he runs a great channel. He's, his name is Meet Kevin. He's got a, a ton of material on, uh, on you know, financial stuff, stocks, and that type of stuff. Young guy, and he's actually running for governor of California. And his quote, or his, uh, his uh, slogan is, I'm not leaving, right? I'm going to stand my ground, and I'm going to fight for California. It's my home, and I really admire that. At the same time, I also think it's insane, right? There's other places to live where they are not going to be raking you over the coals in taxes and living expenses. And so I, you know, I just, I don't understand the appeal of that. Uh, I am somebody who, who think that, thinks that picking up and leaving is very much in the framework of the founders, right? They picked up and left when they got no, when they, when they were, when there was taxation without representation, they said, nope, we're out of here. We're done. We're going to go to the new land, to the new world. And we're going to start our own lives there. And when the government tried to be oppressive to them there, they said, oh, we're, we're done with you, right? Off. And they just kind of picked up and, and left. And so I think that as, as we start to see some alternative options pop up in terms of uh, economic structures, that maybe there will be some other, um, other things worth talking about. But if, if your government is going to be oppressive, in my opinion, you do not need to sit there and take it. Okay, you need to either do something about it politically, peacefully and politically, or you got to leave. But to just sit there and take your government robbing you blind, in my opinion, take, you know, taxing you to death, which is essentially seizing a part of your life away from you for somebody else. It's a big problem. And you have no obligation to stay there. And if you're going to be staying there just out of you know, pride for the love of your state, you got to ask yourself if that's worth it. All right. And, and, and I'm, and I'm a, you know, a very patriotic person. I love this country a lot. I'm not interested in leaving it, but, um, but I understand the, the, 
the argument there. All right. We have Kareem says, has the Democratic Party always been like this? I don't remember it being this bad back in the 90s. But then again, I was just a child at the time. You know, I was also sort of a child in the 90s. And somebody put it, I forget I forget who I was listening to that sort of summarized it for me. But the, the, I noticed the change as well. And I think the change sort of started to happen, I would say maybe back during the Obama years, where sort of pre-Obama, and I'm not blaming Obama for this. I'm not saying that Obama was this was the cause of this transition. I just think this happened during his years. And he was there for eight years, so it was a big transition. But I sort, sort of pre-Obama, I got the feeling that the, that the Democrats were still people who, who loved America. You know, they still liked the country. Bill Clinton, even Hillary Clinton, for all her faults, right, she's still kind of an American. You know, I think that if, if and, and, and I don't actually believe this, but I'm saying in terms of popular culture, right? What America sort of sees as the Democratic Party. If I had to stereotype and generalize them pre-Obama, I would say that I sort of felt like they still liked the country. We all liked America. We all agreed with America. We thought it was a great country and we just wanted to see it do well. We just had a little bit of a difference of opinion on how to do it, right? Republicans were low taxes, small government. Democrats were more social services, a little bit higher taxes, but we all want a booming economy. We all want, you know, nice homes for our kids and everybody wants to be happy and healthy and free. And then something sort of just kind of changed a little bit. It was like, you know, we have this new sort of tone there in Washington. And a lot of it became about sort of, you know, cutting America down to size to some degree and starting to sort of blame America for a lot of the problems in the world. And now that has just ex accelerated exponentially. You know, now America is the fundamental problem in the world. We're responsible for everything. We got to solve global warming. We got to solve all the racial injustice in the world. We got to take care of every single person who wants to come through the borders. We've got to, you know, totally change voting rules so that we can protect democracy and all this stuff that we've been doing fine for some period of time. You know, there's, there's a lot of issues there, but it's all sort of rooted out of this concept that America's not so great anymore. America's just kind of a a systemically racist place. It was birthed out of original sin of slavery, and it is now something that is has been commandeered by white people who've been infiltrating all of the different institutions of powers for the last uh, couple millennia. And so now we have to sort of you know wreck the country or rebuild America in uh, f from from new again. We we have to start over. And to me, that feels largely like they don't like America. And so I think that is the feeling that I've always gotten about it that there was an era of Democrats that loved America. There's an era of Democrats now today that, that don't love America. They don't like it at all. They want to see it radically reformed and changed dramatically. And uh, that doesn't sit well with me. You know, I, I could have a reasonable disagreement with, with a Democrat all day, right? I, I actually don't like a lot of the Republicans that are out there these days. I think the Republicans are largely useless. And so if a Democrat came out with some good ideas and somebody who uh, you know, had, had a vision for the country, I'd say, well, I'll give you, I'll give you a look seriously. And I mean that, but there just aren't any because the parties have become so, I think, so fringy, let's say, and, and uh, on the, on the public facing level, they're very fringy, right? And, and you're going to see a situation where I think they are marketing themselves to their key constituencies loudly you see that on both sides. You see sort of the AOC wing. You also see the Matt Gates wing and the Marjorie Taylor Green wing versus AOC and Ilhan Omar. You sort of have these two components that are you know, bubbling up and they're going to be the loudest part of the dialogue, the loudest people in the room. But practically speaking, while we're all listening to them, what's happening behind the scenes is the Republicans and the Democrats are really sort of acting in concert. I mean, you know, the Democrats kind of get in there and ransack the treasury. Uh, they're, it's their turn right now. The Republicans just got done doing that. And so soon it's going to be the Democrats are going to have their time is going to be up. It's going to be the Republicans turn again. So then they're just going to start printing a bunch of money and promising a bunch of people, a bunch of garbage because they know that that's what it takes to get elected these days. And so it's just kind of a, you know, ping pong back and forth, the pendulum swings back and forth. But historically, you know, when I was a kid, I still felt like the people who were in charge kind of had America's interest at heart. Maybe that was just my 90s child naivete, but I sort of felt that. And now I feel like they're much more open about this, that America is not such a great place anymore, and they would be okay with some radical transformation happening. Leafy Bug is in the house, says, not a comment, 
but a compliment. Thank you for the awesome show. Love watching the commentary and live audience participation. Everyone watching should go subscribe and to go to Robert's Locals Group and join the fun. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Leafy Bug. Very nice. Thank you so much for ending that way. And, you know, I have a ton of fun with uh, you know, doing this show. I really do enjoy it. I learn a lot. I, I talk about the show sort of as, you know, learning publicly, kind of taking ideas and exploring them. A lot of the time I'm sort of, you know, reading or experiencing a lot of this material with you for the first time in real time right here. And so there's going to be ebbs and flows, ups and downs. And, and I just appreciate the opportunity to spend the time with you because it really is rewarding for me and I'm learning a ton and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So thank you, Leafy Bug. And thank you all of you who asked questions today and supported us over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And we want to welcome couple new people oh i like this one we've got damn girls in the house that's gonna be fun we got damn girl welcome to the club when we have miriam phillips is here and miriam phillips that's also a really good one not to downplay that one we've got miriam phillips is in the house so that's going to be a lot of fun too glad that you both joined and welcome to the community also some great questions came in today you know who you are you're up there on the screen if you want to ask questions during the next show you can do so by going over to watching the watchers dot locals dot com there's a live chat that takes place there we also have some other goodies for you to download we've got a free copy of my book it's called beginning to winning you can download the powerpoint slides available for free as well the ones that we just went through you can impeach somebody if you're interested in that document or you can download the existence systems productivity template and we heard from uh, somebody today uh, apologies on the name but they're talking about oh that's not the right box this box on the existence system right here it's called the four agreements Okay, if you want to buy this whole program, it's about two hours and 20 minutes of material. It's over at Gum Road right now. It's down in the description below, or you can buy it at robertgruller.com. Or if you're there at Law Enforcement Interaction Training, it may just be available as a little bonus. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. You know, it's we haven't done it yet. Also, some other good things that you can join up if you go over there. Sign up and join us for our monthly locals meetup we're going to have another one on zoom we did our first one on may may 22nd next one is coming up june 26 so a couple weeks from today then tomorrow get ready for this law enforcement interaction training it's going to be saturday tomorrow june 12th 9 a.m arizona time 12 noon pacific time and yeah 12 noon no 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 that's not right 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern time. Oh my gosh, almost blew that. Could have been a problem. But it's going to be fun. I've got a great clip from this officer who's sort of trying to educate children on what to talk what to talk to officers about and gives you some pretty bad advice. And believe it or not, we've also got Jeffrey Epstein. He's in that. He's in our training tomorrow. We're going to listen to him. Ugh, it kind of gives you the willies, but you're going to listen to him if you're there. We're going to hear how he invokes his Fifth Amendment rights and then we're going to talk about why that's not such a good idea sometimes what it's not a good idea to invoke your fifth amendment rights what rob that's right folks it's going to be training knock your socks off and it's going to be a lot of fun taking place tomorrow so sign up for that it is free if you are a member at watching the watchers.locals.com so go on over there if you want to register you'll see the description there uh a link in the in the uh pin to the top comment so check that out it's going to be fun uh, other than that, my friends, that's it. It's been a long week. We've covered a lot of ground this week. Spent a lot of time. Man, we talked about inflation. We talked about CRT. We talked about Biden. We talked about Harris. Woo, it was a lot. But I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. If you want to connect with us on any of the other platforms, feel free to check those out below. Got a new crypto channel down below. We have a new... Uh, it's not it's not quite new, but r and Law Group is the law firm, right? And that is down below as well. We got a lot of new videos there covering Arizona law because that's what we do on a daily basis at our firm. We are criminal defense attorneys. We love to help good people facing criminal charges. And so if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who needs help with the criminal case, we would love the opportunity to see what we can do to help nudge them in the right direction. We offer free case evaluations. We can help with any type of criminal offense in the state of Arizona. Things like a misdemeanor or a felony, minor traffic infraction, major traffic infraction, DUIs, drugs, domestic violence, and everything and everything in between. So if you need any help or know anybody that does, we would be honored and humbled if you sent them our direction so that we could just have an opportunity to help and see what we could do. Other than that, my friends, we're done for the day today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. We are going to be back here same time, same place on Monday, but we are going to be back here tomorrow, 
9 a.m. for law enforcement interaction training, 9 a.m. Arizona time. I do hope to see you there. Go check out watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Before you sign off today, if you want to be a part of that, it's going to be fun. Otherwise, my friends, have a tremendous evening. Have a very nice, long, restful weekend. Unplug from politics a little bit. Eat heartily and healthy, but healthy. And I will see you right back here on Monday, 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. And that for that one Florida man out there, everybody stay safe, be well. I'll see you back then on Monday. Bye-bye.